Today I just wanted to explain some basic AUR concepts like what is a package that has nothing appended to its name? What is a package that has dash git appended to its name? What is a dash bin package? And even what is a dash git dash bin package? And the other thing I wanted to talk about is why you'd want to decide to use a dash git package over say a dash bin package. Now the first one is a package that has nothing appended to its name. So let's say you're looking at the AUR and you see something called, I don't know, LF. Now, what is that package actually gonna do? So the package build will basically download the latest stable version of the source code. Usually it'll be some sort of release version of it. It's not going to be a binary download, but it will be a stable version of the source code that the developers know actually works. So what it's gonna do is compile that code, it'll arrange the files to work on Arch, and it will create a package to be used within Pac-Man. A dash git package is very similar, except instead of downloading the latest stable code, it will download the absolute latest code. Now generally, this is gonna come from the master branch. It doesn't have to, but most projects will use the master branch for their latest code. So the benefit of doing this is it comes with all of the latest features that come with that application. But the problem is that it may not be the most stable. This will very much depend on what the application is. Sometimes the master branch is perfectly clean. Sometimes it's a bit messy. Sometimes people just dump anything on there. I know that I am really bad for doing this. So if I was to ever do an AUR package, I would always put up a stable build. And then if you want to try the Git version, good luck with that. It's probably going to break. So if you want the absolute most stable package while still compiling the code, then go the version that doesn't have dash Git on it. If you just want the most up-to-date features, dash Git is how you'd go about doing that. As I said before, this will still download the latest version of the code. It'll compile it, it'll arrange the files for Arch and it'll create a package that works within Pac-Man. Now, package-bin is a little bit different because unlike the previous two, package and package-git, you're not actually compiling any code. All you're doing is you're downloading a pre-compiled binary file. So generally, this comes from a Debian package. And the reason for that is because, especially in the case of a lot of proprietary software, for whatever reason, it's first released on Debian or any of the Debian-based distros like Ubuntu or just any of the other Star Ubuntu distros. And once it's actually been released on Debian, it's still been released on a Linux distro. And all the Linux distros are so similar that there is no reason why a package that was originally made for Debian can't just work on Arch Linux, obviously assuming that you can actually get all the dependencies. And generally, there is no reason why you can't do that. So most of the time these are released as Debian packages first and then make their way onto the AUR. Now sometimes this isn't the case. Sometimes it's just released as a pre-compiled binary file. I think one example of this is LF. I think there's an LF-bin and that's not released as a Debian package first. It's just a pre-compiled binary file that you can then download from the AUR or you can download it from the GitHub page. Now, the nice thing about this release method is that generally code compilation is a very, very slow process, especially if you're on really slow hardware, because I know a lot of people like to use older ThinkPads, especially within the Arch Linux community. So if you're on something like that, compiling something like, say, a web browser, for example, is going to take a very, very long time. So if you want to use an application in the quickest way possible while downloading it from the AUR, downloading the binary releases are generally going to be the quickest way to do it. Now, what about this last one? So package-git-bin. So this isn't a very common one to see, and there's a very good reason why it isn't very common. So you can probably work out what it is, but basically it's a combination of the dash git and the dash bin. So it is a binary release of the latest version of the source code. Now, if you were paying attention when I was talking about the dash git version, you can probably work out why this doesn't happen very often. Generally, the latest version of the code isn't stable whatsoever. Sometimes it doesn't even compile. So in cases like that, it doesn't even make sense to have a dash git dash bin because if you can't compile the code, you can't make a binary release. So a lot of the time this doesn't happen just because there's not really much of a point of it. If you're going to make a binary release, you might as well make a binary release from a stable build. And that is basically what that binary release was that we were talking about before. So if you do see this happen, it might be fine. If you have a really, really well-maintained project, it can work where you have a really clean master branch. But 
at least with me, and I know a lot of projects out there do not have a clean master branch, and trying to do this will just result in a absolute mess occurring. Plus, it's just a massive waste to compile every single change that goes to the repo because maybe you might commit, like, I don't know, comments. And if you're going to recompile the binary just because I changed some comments in the code, that doesn't really make any sense. It's kind of just a massive waste to do that. So a lot of projects don't do this. You will see them from time to time. And I might show some examples in just a moment. But generally, you won't see this. Now that we've got our definitions out of the way, why would you want to say download a binary over say a stable or get release or a stable or get release over a binary. Now typically web browsers are a very good example of something that you should always download the binary of. Now I know someone's probably going to come in and say oh it only takes like half an hour to compile Firefox. I don't care that it only takes half an hour to compile Firefox. That's half an hour I don't want to waste compiling a program that I can download the binary of. Now this isn't to say that you can't go and download the stable or get release of something like Firefox or of something like Brave. If you need to modify the source code, then go ahead and do that. But if you have the option of downloading the binary file, I would say that you should always download the binary file. That's just my rule of thumb. You don't have to follow it whatsoever. I'm just trying to save you guys some time. So as I said, Brave is a good example. I've got Brave-bin installed. I have literally no idea how long it would have taken to compile Brave. I tried to do it once. I was sitting there for at least half an hour. It wasn't done. This was on my 3600X. And if it's going to take that long with the 3600X, I have no idea how long it's going to take with something like, say, an older ThinkPad or just even any sort of lower powered device. If you don't have the performance to compile a massive code base like that, I wouldn't bother doing it. Now, this isn't to say that every single browser is like this. Surf is one good example of a very, very small web browser that you can actually compile yourself and it can be done in a reasonable amount of time. But if you're using any of the major browsers, just don't compile them. It's going to take too long. Obviously, the Gen 2 guys are probably going to say, we compile everything, it's fine. I have better things I want to do with my day. I typically want to use my web browser within the hour. That's just, that's just a me thing. But if you disagree with me and you think compiling your web browser is the best thing to do all the time, go right ahead and do it. I'm not going to stop you. And it's not just with web browsers though, if it's something like say Joplin, I would download the binary release of that because that's also a very big application, or just anything that you think is going to take a very long time to compile. If it's going to take a long time to compile, I would generally just download the binary release unless you have a very good reason to do otherwise. And that reason would be that you want to edit the source code. So a good example of this is say there is a Windows release and a Linux release of I don't know, a terminal file manager, because yes, there are a couple that work on both. So maybe there is some sort of feature disabled in the Linux version just to make the compilation process easier for the developers. Now, maybe you want to actually go and enable that feature, or maybe you want to do something like, say, add new features. If you download the binary release, you can't do that. Whereas if you download the source code with the stable or git release, you can go and modify the source code to your heart's content. And then once you've done that, you can then install the package. Another example of this is with the suckless utilities. Now it's not really advised to download the AUR packages for them. You can do it. You probably should just go and download the source code for yourself and then make your own package for it. But that's a whole nother story. These pieces of software are intended to actually be modified. So you're supposed to install patches. You're supposed to modify the source code to change some settings. You're supposed to just make the application be exactly what you want it to be. And if you want to put the effort into it, you can really make a suckless utility exactly what you want it to be. Now, they aren't the only examples of this. There's a window manager called Xmonad, which DT did a video on recently, which is also intended to be modified like this. But the suckless utilities are the most notable examples. So generally, the rule of thumb is if it's a big application that you don't have any reason to modify, download the binary release. If you want to modify the source code, download the stable or git release. Another question you might have is whether you should download from the AUR or the standard repos if a package is available in both. So let's just use a hypothetical of say Vim. So if Vim is in the AUR and Vim is in the standard repos, which one should you download? Now generally it doesn't really matter. So the features are normally going to be the same. If you need to modify the source code though, it's normally easier to do if you download it from the AUR. But if you don't need to do that, you might as well just download from the standard repos. 
Also, another thing is that even though the AUR is generally really safe, especially for very popular applications, there's always the possibility that someone is going to try to do something malicious with it. Yes, this can be done with the standard repos as well. It's just much harder to actually get something into the standard repos than it is to get into the AUR. So, because of that, if it's available in the standard repos, download it from the standard repos. If it's not, just download it from the AUR. And if it's not in the AUR, well, I guess you're gonna have to learn how to compile code yourself then. Let's just see if we can find some examples of these package types. So, as we see on here, this first one here. So for yay right here, this is just a stable release because it has nothing appended after its name. Same with this release for Zoom as well. Now, I didn't even realize there was a version of Zoom for Linux, but hey, that's cool, I guess. Let's go a bit further down. As we can see, there is Brave here. So Brave-bin. So it also says in the description right here, this is a binary release of Brave. So let's see if we can find anything else. Same for Visual Studio Code-bin. This is the binary release of Visual Studio Code. Let's see if we can find some dash git packages. Now I was testing this just off camera and as we can see there is nearly 17,000 dash git packages. I don't know what most of this stuff is going to do, but basically as you can see this is the latest release for any of these repos here. Let's see if we can find some stuff for dash bin. So if we go dash bin, there's far less of them, but there's nearly 1900 packages, so let's say this one here. So 3d slicer dash bin. This is a binary release of 3D Slicer. I think that is a 3D printing software or 3D slicing software or something like that. I The name rings a bell, but I'm not entirely sure. Anyway, now what about dash git dash bin? Now, I, I tested this one and there is not many. By not many, I mean there is actually one. This one comes up as one, but yeah, it's, it's very, very rare to see a dash git dash bin just because, as I mentioned before, there's not really much of a point to do it. So, generally, it's not a thing that really happens. So, I think that's pretty much everything for me. But before I go, I want to thank my patrons. So, a special thank you to Joachim, Nathan, Andrew Parton, Dot Road, Tony, Donald, Oak, Larry, and Zilver. If you want to join the Patreon, there'll be a link to that down below, as well as my Amazon affiliate links where you can buy the gear I use in this channel, or just anything else you want, and I'll get a small kickback for it. Also remember to go check out my podcast, Take Over Tea, that is available on Library and YouTube. And remember to smash the like button and leave me a comment down below. And remember to subscribe and ding the bell icon down below as well. So I think that's pretty much everything for me, and I'm out.